Hello everybody, my name is Chris Brady, author of the Boeing 737 Tech Guide and the Boeing 737 Tech Site. And this presentation is on the Boeing 737 fuel systems. So quite a lot to cover in this, uh, perhaps surprisingly. Um, start with a quick overview, then we'll cover the internal fuel panels, refueling and defueling, the tanks, pumps, centre tank fuel, APU fuel, uh, fuel temperature, uh, quantity measurement indication, auxiliary fuel and heat exchangers. As always, please treat your company training and their manuals as the authoritative source of information. Okay, so just by way of an overview, um, what I've got here is, is a schematic I've drawn up. Those of you who've got the, um, the, the book or seen it on the website will be familiar with this. It's, um, it's very similar to the one in the FCOM, a little bit more detail uh, here and there. Um, and it's also a hybrid of the of the classic and the NG system, uh, labelled as such for differences. Uh, it's always an issue with, with 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 me, you know, exactly how much detail to include on these schematics, you know, without making them too busy and too unintelligible. But um, anyway, there it is. It's uh, it's for your reference if you need it. All right, on with uh, internal fuel panels. So a uh, little bit of history, <laughs> so you can see the derivation of the uh, of the fuel panel. Um, this is what it looked like on the uh, on the original aircraft, the the one and two hundred series. It's actually very similar uh, to the to the current fuel panel on the on the Max today, but th there are some differences, and um, and those are all in that area of shown in the in the red circle, and obviously again on the on the number two side as well. The the, the big difference really is is around the heating system so you, you, which which wasn't on any other generation other than the originals so you've got filter icing lights um, on the originals which is subtly different to the, the, the later versions and these will indicate either an iced or contaminated fuel filter um, so if that comes on you put the heat switches on uh, and that gives you 13 stage bleed uh, to heat the fuel just before the fuel filter it, um, in, in the engine. These are solenoid held switches. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see that, um, that the solenoid held switches on the on the 73 do look slightly different to the ones that we normally pull and move. Um, and that's because they're, they're, they're on a one minute timer. So they'll, they'll flick back to the off position after a minute. Um, and as with, uh, with 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 a lot of uh, switches on the on the 73, a lot of valves, we, we've got a valve, a blue valve uh, open light, uh, which has got the same bright blue, dim blue logic as as all other blue lights. Now, this fuel heating system, it's it's actually designed to be used uh, intermittently, and um, Boeing recommend uh, using it one for one minute every 30 minutes whenever the temperature the fuel temperatures at or below zero degrees to keep the, the the filter clear so in other words use it as as you would um, uh, and use it as an anti-icer not a de-icer you know you, you use it as you would I, I guess engine anti-ice or, uh, or or wing anti-ice Okay, so forward to the classics, and as you can see round the round the red circle area, it's a lot less busy, a lot of space. So you now know the reason for all that space because they took the fuel heater system out. Um, so all we've got now is a, a filter bypass light. So again, the the names changed here. It, it was filter icing, but now they've just called it filter bypass. So it it'll, it'll indicate a bypass depending on you know whatever the reason be it be it ice or contamination um, it's th there's a sense by two fuel filter diff pressure switches uh, one on each side and in, perhaps importantly that they, they show when the fuel filter begins to clog uh, so it's a, when when you've got an impending bypass uh, so it, it doesn't contrary to what what the the caption might say which could indicate that the filter has bypassed it actually comes on early bit before the things uh, clogged to, to give you a chance to do something about it which is very helpful of Boeing to design it that way. On to the uh, the current panel it's the same for the NG and the Max um, and the the big difference here 
um, is that your, your, your fuel valve close light is now being replaced by engine valve closed and spar valve closed. So they're differentiated between the engine valve and the spar valve. Um, both of these are controlled by both the start levers and the uh, the fire the, the fire switches. Now, it's perhaps worth mentioning uh, for those of you still on the classics. Um, the classics do also have a spar valve. Um, I I must confess I didn't find this out till uh, till I've been on the classics for for a few years. Um, I mean. Why would you? Because the, the, there's no blue light up there to, to let you know you've got one, but you do have one. Um, so the, there is on the classics both an engine valve and a spar valve. Uh, you just don't have the blue light for the spar valve. Um, it I know it isn't shown on on the on the FCOM schematic, but but trust me, it's there. And the I I've proved dozens and dozens of dozens of times it's there um, on air test because what one of the checks we do is um, is after landing for shutdown we shut down by um, by pulling the fire switches um, and on the classics when you do that it takes around 25 to 30 seconds because um, obviously you're at idle idle thrust for the shutdown uh, for that fuel f to be used up between the spar valve and the engine whereas we all know that when you shut down an engine with the uh, with the start lever, it happens pretty much immediately. Um, so that is that is actual physical proof that there is a spar valve on the on the classics for for those of you that that, that may doubt it. Um, but just on the NG and the Max panel, they've they've given us the the, the indication light. The spar valve uh, on the well on the NG and the Max. Um, it's powered by its own uh, battery pack, um, and which is in turn powered by the um, by, by the hot battery bus. Um, this battery pack actually lives behind the P6 panel. It's 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 built into it. Um, I don't have a photo to show of you to to show it you, unfortunately. But you can you can see the circuit breaker there, labelled power pack. And uh, I've given you an extract of the, the the schematic, which you may remember from the the electrics video, showing you where it's uh, it gets its power source from. So the um, the the spar valve will always be there for us uh, in an emergency, even with a with a total loss of electrics, um, assuming the battery pack's charged, which of course it uh, it should be. All right, a word on fuel balancing. Um, now, as we know, the maximum allowable fuel imbalance is 453 kilos, and that odd number, for those of you that haven't realised, comes from the American round number of a thousand pounds. If you notice a fuel imbalance, uh, and there's always some fuel imbalance, um, you know, it's a question of degree as as as, as to when you start to take action. Um, but really, what what I'm, the point I want to get across here is is that that really good airmanship you should first consider why the imbalance occurred why is it there before you jump into uh, to cross feeding and, and, and balancing in case there's a fuel leak or a, or a defective cross feed valve um, once you've had a look around you're happy that it's just either a loading issue APU burn single engine tax whatever it might be then go ahead and balance the fuel um, if you need it there's a supplementary procedure for doing the the fuel balancing but I think most of us are quite happy doing this um, this from memory all I would say is don't mess it up if you're going to do it from memory and um, and don't forget to stop balancing and I've I've seen both of these done um, as I'm sure you all have as well it's so easy to forget uh, that, that you're balancing and um, it can it can go horribly wrong and there's there's an instance here and, and you know that there have been dozens if not hundreds if not thousands of these across the the lifetime of the 737 um, the only reason I'm choosing this one is because it's just one I, I happen to know I guess being UK based and there was a quite a detailed report um, published on this and you can google it from that type and registration um, but anyway, for, for whatever reason, the crew um, forgot they were cross-feeding fuel 
uh, for an hour and 15 minutes the imbalance got to 1600 kilos um, and during that time the, the yoke started to to turn toward the um, the, uh, the, the the heavy side as, as the ailerons were trying to uh, compensate for, for this this imbalance they reached their maximum autopilot authority which is 20 degrees of control wheel deflection um, which is a lot less than the 82 degrees we can apply manually um, but again they, they, this went unnoticed um, until the aircraft got to about 45 degrees angle of bank and, and, and wouldn't um, sorry it got to 20 degrees control wheel deflection the uh, the aircraft stopped being able to hold the LNAV track uh, and, and and started veering off track at which point that that brought the crew's attention to it they they disengaged the autopilot with uh, well, let's just say alarming results and you, you know you can read the report yourselves to see see what happened next um, what came out of that report was that the um, the, the the use of an egg timer um, was 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 certainly part of the the the, the problem here, and um, this quote from the report um, d discusses it, um, and and in essence the crew had been trained to cross feed using an egg timer as an aid memoir to stop cross feeding and the incident aircraft didn't have an egg timer um, and I guess the takeaway point here is is the, the part I've underlined in red which says that if crews get used to operating with timers they'll become reliant on them so a mix of aircraft with and without timers would create more of a risk so what wh what do we do for an aid memoir if We've, we've got a mixed fleet or don't have a timer or what have you, you, you kind of need something that, 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 that you're going to it's going to attract your attention all the time now I've flown with guys who've who've done all kinds of things um, a common one is to, is to pull the grab handle down over the windscreen, another one I've seen done is to clip the bottom of your tie to the yoke um, but I've also seen the guy that did that forget to notice that his tie was clipped to the yoke Personally, I think if you're going to use an aid memoir, it, it, these days we've all got mobile phones, so you, you, you could probably put a timer in there um, because you know you've always got it, you always fly with it. But it's it's up to you. Um, but whatever works for you. All right, on to refueling and defueling. Um, the panel, as we know, is under the, the starboard wing out near the leading edge. Uh, it's powered from the hot battery bus when the panel is open. So there's actually a little um, a switch in the uh, in the door opening mechanism which which powers it when, when it's opened. To refuel the aircraft, so, so the, the power for the battery panel is one thing, but to refuel it, you, you need either electrical power on the, um, on the buses, as you'd expect, um, ground power connected but not necessarily on the buses um, APU generator uh, running or battery power with the battery switch on so there's actually different electrical requirements for just using the panel and uh, refueling but they're all quite low requirements if, if you if you get what I mean so that the fueling can um, can possibly happen when when the crew aren't there This is what the uh, the inside of the refueling panel looks like. Um, you see there's a little uh, light, well actually there are a couple of in inspection lights there, uh, service interphone socket. The uh, the refueling point, notice there's no cap on that on the, uh, on the NG and the Max series. And you've also got three solenoid override switches. Um, and these are to force the valves open if they have uh, if they've shut off so if you've got the switches to direct the fuel to either wing or sense tanks or whatever it might be when the tanks fill the valves will automatically close now if those switches are acting up you may need to override by pushing these these switches or um, and again, guilty as charged of doing this in the in the in the bad old days in the in the 90s when we, you're trying to get a, a 737 Classic back from a, a destination, you know, nearly five hours away from from base. You want that little bit of extra fuel, 
um, it's it's very tempting, and I really don't condone this or recommend that you know it's done these days. But um, and, and there's there's no need to on a on an NG or a Max, I'd suggest. But um, but but certainly on earlier aircraft where you needed that extra bit of fuel, you 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 might. <laughs> um, you might just hold these these switches in to, to just top up the wing tanks that little bit more to, to fill the surge tanks. Dangerous game because if you overdo it, then you'll overfill the, the surge tanks and the fuel will come out of the uh, out of the vents. So um, use these switches with care um, because fuel spillages are very expensive and very embarrassing. So. Um, on the panels themselves, I say use the uh, the open close switches to direct the fuel into into whichever tank you need. Um, the blue lights illuminate when the tank valve switch is open and the tank isn't full, and the those lights extinguish when the tank is full or you switch the uh, the switch off. Uh, these gauges are an absolute repeater of the ones in the flight deck, so they'll they'll read the same as as what's going on in there. The bottom photo shows these little sort of um, they they always remind me of the B2 uh, Spirit st uh, Stealth Bomber. Um, they are your, your quantity preset selectors, um, which are an option. Uh, quite a quite a rare option, I have to say. Not many airlines went for it, but you can pre-select in the uh, the fuel quantity you need. There's uh, a dedicated earth bonding point on the inside of the wheel well for the, for the fuelers to uh, to attach the the, 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 the bonding clip to. Um, this, of, of course, essentially be done before the, the fuel nozzle gets to the uh, the aircraft um, to to reduce the chance of a, of a static electricity spark jumping between that nozzle and the refueling panel when the nozzle is connected. Um, I mean the, the the whole sparks thing. I'm I'm not saying you should take it lightly at all, but um, I, I I was on a um, I was shown a demonstration by by an airport fire service, and again, don't practice this at home, um, where they they poured some some jet fuel into a tray and proceeded to strike matches and throw them into the into the tray of fuel, and. Uh, and each match just extinguished as it as it as it touched the fuel. Um, so jet fuel is is fairly hard to ignite with a well certainly with a match and and, and perhaps with a spark. Um, but uh, but anyway, these precautions <laughs> these precautions should be taken. And uh, and all the fuelers I've ever seen in in, in my career have been really meticulous in in doing this, which is a good thing. If you need it, uh, the originals and classics have got an overwing fueling port uh, in case the pressure refueling is not available. Uh, I've never had to do this in my entire career on the 737, and I, I, I don't think I've even heard of anybody who's done it. But um, but if I guess if you if you're out in some far flung corner of the world, then it's an option, or it was an option on the originals and the classics. No longer on the NG and the uh, and the Max. Uh, the defueling valve again. This is something you really don't want to get involved in if you can if you can avoid it. Um, but if you ever do have to either defuel or or ground transfer of fuel, then uh, my advice to you, if you can't get an engineer to do it for for you, uh, is to follow the FCOM supplementary procedures to the letter. Uh, it's all in there if you ever need to do it. Um, First thing you've got to do is find the defueling valve, um, and it's in a hatch which is just inboard of the regular refueling panel. Um, and I say it's the, the, this this particular valve. It's used for both. Although it's called the defueling valve, it's used for both defueling and ground transfer of fuel. Fuel tanks. So um, this is the underside of an NG. And uh, I've drawn on the picture where the where the tanks are. the The sense tank on the on the NG and the Max is uh, is hugely increased in size over the uh, over the classics. It's uh, it's a thirteen ton capacity now compared to uh, to, to seven ton. So it actually now 
rather than being confined to um, the, the fuselage area, it actually extends into the into the wing roots as well. Um, a lot of debate as to, as to why this was done. Um, they, I mean, obviously, I guess, I guess the primary reason w w was to increase the, the the maximum amount of fuel available to to give the the aircraft more range, um, but. It it also had um, an, another benefit in in that it, it pushed the main tanks out because the the main tanks are actually reduced in size from four six to to three nine, um, and what that does is because the the the, the main tanks are, are you know always used even on the shortest flights, um, it helps with the wing bending moment because that fuel is is further outboard now and certainly further outboard for for, for longer. Um, so that the, there's actually quite a good spin-off uh, for that, in, in addition to total capacity. Uh, you can see I've, I've I've listed all the various capacities of the the various configs of originals, classics, NGs. Um, search tanks as, as well. I mentioned those earlier. They've got 108 kilos capacity. They are not part of the usable fuel total. Um, despite what tricks you might get up to down route if you need to take the extra fuel back. Um, so, just coming on to surge tanks then, so uh, as we've seen outboard of each main tank, you, you, you've got this, uh, these surge tanks, and this photo here is capturing uh, fuel coming out of a surge tank. Um, so, what's probably happened here is that the, 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 the main tank on that side has been overfilled. Um, it's overflowed into the surge tank which is which is why the surge tank is there um, now either some then started pouring out onto the apron uh, which would be an extreme case or as more like usually the case when the aircraft takes off um, and and you know starts turning um, then that that extra that surge tank fuel will start to drain out of the uh, the vent in in level flight or reasonably level flight, the the fuel in the surge tank will actually drain back into the main tanks. Uh, what once once there's enough room in the main tanks to accept it, you know, once that main tank fuel is burnt off. Um, but obviously on takeoff, that that wouldn't be the case. So uh, so the fuel would have been in the surge tank and 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 will will pour out of there. So this is a close-up of of the of the tank vent, um, and you can see that the in in this close-up that it, it it's actually an air scoop. It's it's it, it's a it's a knacker duct, um, and you will you will have seen these also at the ram air inlets and also the APU air inlet. It's the same sort of shape, and you know for for good reason. It's it it's proven to work, and. So the reason for this this air intake uh, is to provide a small positive head of pressure on the fuel air in the fuel tanks. And interestingly, it's not only the the wing tanks, um, but it's the center tank as well, uh, as as they're they're interconnected uh, on 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 the top for, for for air pressure. And then what this does, uh, it does a number of things. It, it having this this vent here prevents a vacuum forming as, as the fuel's used um, which stops any damage to the fuel tanks or you know any flame outs to, to, to the engines as, as you know if there was a vacuum it would stop the it would eventually stop the fuel getting to the engines um, but it the, so that assists the fuel pumps but it, it, it also reduces um, ev ev evaporation as, as well um, by having that positive head of pressure on the it, if the pressure was too low, you know, as, as it would be, say, at the cruise altitude, then the the fuel will tend to evaporate quicker, but, but with, with less partial pressure on it. That that's just a a law of physics. So having that positive head of pressure on it will will keep the the, the, the fuel in place. Um, as I say, that is also where any uh, any fuel spillage will happen if uh, if the tanks are overfilled. Now, behind that vent, there is a wire gauze uh, 
fitted to the to, to the entrance of that of that, of that surge tank. Um, well, not actually not on all all aircraft, but but on but on most. And this is what's known as a flame arrester. So if any fuel were to 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 come out of the vent, you know, in, in an overfueling scenario. And were to ignite on the uh, on on the apron, the wire gauze will actually stop the flame from entering the surge tank. Now this is something which has been known for centuries, and um, and you can see the graphic there. I, I don't have a video showing th this, but I've I've got one in a moment. I'll show you the other way around. The, the, this was a demonstration I remember being shown in chemistry class in, in when I was about twelve. Um, the, the chemistry teacher lit, lit the Bunsen burner, put a gauze in, and the the flame stopped at the gauze. He then extinguished the flame and lit the the, the flame above the gauze, and as you see in the picture, the the flame burns. And old coal miners' safety lamps use this, so that the flame will not travel through the gauze. And uh, here in this video, we we can actually see a gauze being introduced into into a flame. And the flame stops at the gauze, and why it, this happens is because the gauze is conducting the heat energy away from the flame. As you saw from the previous slide, you can also light the gas and Bunsen burner above the gauze, and the, and the flame won't pass through down through the gauze for the same reason. So that's what's going on inside the uh, the, the fuel vent. Now, does that gauze? You can think of it uh, if if you like. I mean, it's it's similar to uh, quite a wide gauge. Uh, filter. Now any filters of course can become blocked and if they become blocked the vent becomes blocked and you lose all of those uh, reasons for having the vent that I, I listed a couple of slides back. So what you need if you've got a flame arrestor fitted on on your aircraft is a, a, a pressure relief valve and that's what you can see just inboard of the vent there shown in red um, and that is also going into the surge tank. I'm, I'm fairly sure these are standard on the NG and the Max. I, I can't think why they wouldn't be. But uh, but not all classics have, have got them. And, and there may even be some NGs which haven't got them. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But the way to tell if you've got a, um, a flame arrestor on your aircraft is to look to see if you've got this pressure relief valve uh, just inboard of the vent. If you have, then you've got a flame arrestor. There you go. Good to know. Um, now this photo, uh, th th this is actually w what you will see if a pressure relief valve actually activates. Um, this happened to me on a on a, on a flight test. Um, I I had no idea on the flight test it had activated. I mean, w why would I? The fuel flow was certainly certainly normal, um, but. Uh, I, I discovered it. Well, actually, the engineers discovered it on the on the on the post-flight external inspection, which uh, you should always do after an air test. I've had panels come off uh, left, right, and centre on these flights. Um, so th that got their curiosity, and I'll, uh, they they were certainly asking what I'd done on the on the flight. But but that's what it is. Um, so when activated, the this pressure relief valve effectively becomes a second vent. Uh, it, it actually you can see it there pushed up into the into the surge tank just to let the the air in and after landing the um, the, the, the engineers can can get a long ladder and, and simply just pull that reset handle to, um, to to reset the valve the um, auxiliary fuel tanks don't vent through the those uh, those knacker ducts um, the the wing tanks and the center tank do, but not the auxiliary. They you have usually got vents elsewhere. It it does depend who's fitted the system. Um, there are all kinds of different um, uh, third-party companies that, that 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 do auxiliary tanks, um, but on many of them, they have this extra vent. The the bizarre thing about this, and this this confused me for quite a while until I I, I managed to see the, the the drawings about it, is that as you can see on the photo, this vent is actually forward of the um, of the centre tank. The auxiliary tank is actually aft of the centre tank. So why on earth the vent is here and not behind the wing? I don't know. I I really don't. But 
but trust me this is the vent for the auxiliary tank which is behind the wheel well um, I'm sure there was a good reason why they put it there but it's it's beyond me if you look very closely in that close look you can just see a little cross uh, or crosswise in there that's that's not a flame arrestor that that's just to keep birds from nesting in there or, or, or whatever might might be in all right so the the, the other access panels that, that, that don't have the um, the, the the pressure relief valve just look like that. Uh, they're sort of oval shaped panels along the, the, the whole length of the wings. Quite a lot of them have got fuel measuring sticks in which uh, I'll, I'll mention later on. Um, the inboard three, um, as you can see from the labeling, they are labeled as impact resistant doors. So they are, uh, they've got additional strengthening in them. And the reason is that, um, as, as you can just see at the bottom of the photo, that's where the landing gear is. So it's to, it's to protect the, 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 the wings and in particular the tanks against damage from, from any objects thrown up by tyres or even the tyres themselves. Now, I, I think there was no uh, greater or sadder demonstration of, uh, of this than the, than the Air France Concorde accident in, in, in Paris where um, tyre debris uh, puncture the fuel tanks on uh, on on takeoff. Okay, onto fuel pumps. Um, this is the the back of a fuel pump in the photo. It's the the main tank number two aft boost boost pump, which you can see in the wheel well. Um, the forward boost pump you won't find in the wheel well. Um, that is visible only when you have the uh, the leading edge devices extended. It, it's you can see the, you can see it behind the Kruger flaps. Uh, up in the the one o'clock position of that pump is the um, the, the low pressure switch. Um, so that's that's where the, the the sensing for that comes from the, the, that we see in the flight deck. Um, so the, there are two uh, two AC power fuel boost pumps in each tank. Uh, the pickups are at the the front and the rear of the bottom of the tanks to ensure that, that all the fuels available uh, both at low quantities and at high alphas or, or accelerations or, or indeed decelerations. The, um, the low pressure lights are required to illuminate when uh, also both low pressure lights are required to, to bring on the mast caution to avoid spurious warnings and I'm sure we've all seen on on takeoff, you know, just out the corner of your eye, the, the you know the the, the forward pumps you often illuminate low pressure um, during rotation. They can also come on, you know, at, at, at you know other high angle of attack uh, maneuvers as well. Hopefully, you won't see them on a low angle of attack maneuver. Um, that would be quite alarming. The aircraft can suction feed as well. So if you lose um, all the electrics um, and all the pumps were to stop working uh, don't worry suction feeding is uh, is available there are, there's an engine driven pump on each engine which will uh, which will pull the, the, the fuel through quite uh, quite happily uh, and that comes through a bypass valve in the tank you can see the I've, I've indicated in green on the schematic the the path that uh, the, the, that fuel takes now what I will say is, um, whilst I've been happily telling you that, that, that suction feeding will work, um, trust me, suction feeding won't work in the climb or indeed soon after top of climb um, because the reduction in air pressure causes any air dissolved in the fuel to bubble out and this will lead to cavitation at the, at the pumps and cause a flame out. And uh, I've got the t-shirt for this. Um, I was doing an air test with uh, for a customer. Uh, they brought along the CAA of their their country, who brought along a what 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 they claimed to be a a Boeing flight test schedule, which included a suction feed ch check at twenty four thousand feet. Um, in in the climb, they said. Now I expressed my reservations about doing this uh, because I. <laughs> Fortunately, being trained in physics, I, I I was aware that this this was was a risk. But they, anyway, they insisted. So I said, "Well, look, I'll I'll try it, but I I will tell you now what I expect to happen." 
So we took off, we climbed 24,000 feet. I, I switched off the pumps on one engine. So the, uh, the, the number one side I was obviously only going to do this one at a time. And sure enough, the engine ran down. Um, the, the look on their faces was priceless. Um, I switched the pumps back on and the engine uh, re resumed normal power. So, um, so I say suction feeding won't happen. Now, if, if, if you want a, a much safer demonstration of this, um, and I think I mentioned this in, um, in, in another presentation, but the trick is take a sealed bottle of water with you and, um, and, and somewhere toward the top of climb, open that bottle and even still water, it doesn't have to be carbonated. Uh, when you open the bottle, when you release the pressure or, and, and, and allow the, the, the pressure to, to reduce in, in, in that bottle, to to ambient eye cabin pressure so it's about 8,000 feet you will see bubbles appear on the inside of that bottle and on a that's exactly the same that happens in the fuel tanks and more importantly in the fuel pumps now that those bubbles will dissipate with time um, it, it depends on on altitude and temperature you know as to how quick that process happens but I would say around about um, 15 minutes after top of climb you should be as, as, uh, enough air uh, will have dissipated out of the fuel for suction feeding to be um, to, to be safe. All right, water draining. Um, now, we we of course all remember doing this in 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 our light aircraft days. Uh, you come along with your uh, your little water little transparent tube, and uh, and and drain a little bit of fuel out the bottom of the tanks to, to, to look for any water. Well, the same thing happens on the 737, but we, fortunately we don't have to do it. Uh, it's done by the engineers, uh, usually as part of the daily inspection, and the, the photos on the right show that being uh, conducted. The main tanks is the bottom photo. That looks most familiar to, to, to us, the way we did it in our Cessnas and our Cherokees. Um, the upper photo is the is the center tank sump drain, which is a slightly different arrangement. Um, now, in addition to draining um, fuel out to remove water, what happens um, any time the 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 boost pumps are on? They power for water scavenge jet pumps. Uh, there are two of these in the center tank and one in each main tank. They pick up from the lowest point in tanks where, where, where the water might pool and mix this with, with straight boost pump fuel to be sent to the engines uh, for, for combustion. Now, it might sound alarming that we're, we're sending water to the engines, but again, <laughs> don't worry about it. In the, in the kind of quantities we're, 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 we're talking about, it's not a problem. And uh, don't forget, in days of old, people used to inject water into engines for uh, for, for extra a, a bit of extra thrust. Um, so these operate, we're, we're, as I say, whenever the boost pumps are on. The for the 737 water remo removal is is to prevent tank corrosion r rather than the flame out. Um, and as a, a side benefit, it also helps the the water the the, the fuel quantity calculations. By uh, by not affecting the, um, the 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 specific gravity, which uh, again we'll, we'll we'll come on to in a moment. The other pumps we've got are the the center tank scavenge pumps, which you uh, you're probably very familiar with. Um, these transfer any residual fuel from the center tank into tank one, uh, around about one to two hundred kilos an hour. It's powered by the uh, by the forward main pump in tank one. No moving parts on this. Uh, it's it's scavenge pumps basically ju just work by venturi. So as as you know, one pump works. The the, the low pressure on that draws fuel through the um, through the feed on the on the scavenge pump. Trigger for the scavenge pump and the originals and the classics are um, switching both sense tank pumps off. That uh, starts a 20-minute timer for the scavenge pump. On the NG and the MAX, as uh, you probably know, it starts automatically when main tank 1 drops below 1990 kilos. 
Uh, once started, it continues for the remainder of the flight. Right, center tank fuel. Um, so the sequencing of it, um, when we, we know that when we put all six pumps on, with with fuel in each tank, the center tank fuel is uh, is burnt first. Um, how does that happen? Well, on the classics, there are um, the, the, there are spring loaded flapper check valves. Um, you know, it's it, it's no more scientific than that. Uh, a spring loaded flapper and the and and the spring on the on the sense tanks is is set to a much lower opening pressure of 1.3 psi, whereas on the main tanks it's up at 12 psi so the the, the the flapper opens much sooner on the on the center tanks than the the main ones that, that lets that fuel be, um, get get used first on the ng the center tank pumps actually produce a higher output pressure uh, it's over twice as high at 23 psi than the main tank pumps so that fights its way through to the engines first and uh, and uses the center tank fuel first either way the results the same on all types um, you, you use the the sense tank fuel first. On the the originals and the classics, the sense tank pumps are actually located in a dry area of the wing roots, so we we can't see them. But on the NG and the Max, uh, again, it's all there on display for us. We can see these uh, in 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 the wheel well. Uh, that photo there showing the, uh, the 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 right center tank boost pump. Which you can locate near the uh, the reservoir pressure gauge, um, and that again is 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 proof, if it were needed, that the the, the forward wall, the wheel well, is actually the back of the of the center fuel tank. The um, you be aware of bulletin, uh, well, the, the, and Boeing numbering it's it's 48 of the of the sent tank fuel system tank changes. Um, I'm not sure if everybody is is now aware of the background to this. Um, these things do kind of fade into into history. Um, th there were two 737s which um, which basically exploded on the ground. Um, caused by sense tank pumps running when the tank was almost empty and of course the the, the very famous TWA 800 accident. Um, now following those events and, and others to other aircraft types, so this isn't, wasn't just a 737 problem by a long chalk, uh, various changes were introduced um, and they included the use of sense tank pumps, introduction of auto shutoff pumps, changes to the config alert and the introduction of nitrogen generation. I'm the, the this fuel presentation I'm, I'm doing now is is already going to be fairly lengthy, so what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to break out NGS and the and the background to this uh, in a separate video, which I will do next. So that that'll be coming out sometime in the next fortnight. The auto shutoff pumps um, were delivered from. Uh, early 2004 and you can see if you've got them by checking your circuit breaker panel so this is on the p63 panel so it's just over the the fo's right shoulder um are where all the fuel circuit breakers are and if you see these four circuit breakers which are actually labeled auto shut off boost pump center tank and then left or right dc or ac then you've got the um then you've got the new pumps and really i think most operators should have them by now um a retrofit has been available for these since 2009 so if your aircraft's older than the 2004 model you should still be able to have them on anyway what these do is these automatically shut off af uh, after 15 seconds of low output pressure uh, the, the 15 second gaps ju just to stop any any you know spurious low pressure in, uh, events denying you the use of your sense tank fuel the master caution lights and fuel uh, system enunciator light now illuminate when either sense tank fuel pump indicates low pressure, and it always used to be when both indicated low pressure. So again, this this was one of the changes that that, that was incorporated. The config alert also changed. Um, it, it again, it was it was a slightly different logic before. Um, 
before these these auto shutoff pumps so it now displays when the sense tank fuel quantity is greater than 726 kilos uh, with the engines running and both center tank fuel pump switches off uh, it'll disappear when the quantity drops below 363 kilos quick word on APU fuel um, back to the schematic uh, you can see that fuel uh, APU uses fuel from the number one tank if a C power is available when running the APU uh, select a number one tank pump on to supply fuel under pressure to assist the uh, the APU fuel control unit and then this note is actually uh, given to us in the, uh, the the normal procedures of the FCOM there was a, a <laughs> say a little bit uh, widespread misunderstanding um, of of exactly what was required here you, you you wouldn't think this could get so complicated but it but it did um, I think because this note was written just beneath where it says APU switch as needed start um, people interpreted and, and I was one of those people interpreted that this that, that, that we needed the the boost pumps on ideally before starting the APU um, eventually we came well, when it became fleet tech captain I queried this with Boeing and uh, and they said no it's it's you don't need a boost pump to start the APU uh, in fact if you follow the procedures the boost pumps won't be on at this stage um, it's just extended ground running uh, if, if, if you're going to use the APU for a long time then have a boost pump on just to to help the, uh, the the APU fuel control unit. So there we go. Hopefully that 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 clears up some of the 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 the, the confusion about that. There is um, an optional extra DC powered fuel pump in the number one tank, which operates automatically during the start sequence. So if you've got one of those, uh, you, you could arguably not not require the the the, the boost pump as well. Now, if there's a leak in the APU fuel supply line, if you, if you think about it, the, 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 the APU has got to take that fuel all the way from the number one tank, all the way down the, down the keel of the aircraft um, and up to the APU. So this is quite a long fuel run there. Now, that fuel line um, has, has got, a, got a shroud around it to collect any possible fuel that might leak. And that drains out here of this drain mast which is just behind the wheel well so if you see anything leaking out of this drain mast then then do report it because it'll either be fuel from a leaking APU uh, line or uh, some vented hy hydraulic fl fluid from the uh, from the reservoirs neither of which are particularly desirable um, and certainly the fuel one is is quite a, a hazard. Uh, it, some of the, the the drain masks we know are okay if we see things come out of them. That you know the water drain ones in particular, uh, you, you know you, you you might see these you know running on a turnaround if somebody's using the the the, the sinks in in the in the the laths. Um, but this one you should never normally see anything uh, dripping out of. I uh, say so if you do, flag it up to an engineer. Fuel temperature. Um, we know the AFM limitations, I'm sure, um, but it mentions the uh, the minimum fuel temperature of minus 43 or three degrees above the fuel freezing point temperature, whichever is higher. Well, you know, who on earth knows what the fuel freezing point temperature is? Uh, I always thought that was a bit, well, unhelpful, shall we say, as a as a limit as a limitation uh, I guess they couldn't put a hard and fast figure but I can tell you that the typical freezing point of Jet A1 is minus 47 and I think this is probably where the minus 43 comes from because if you if you add 3 to minus 47 you get minus 44 so put in an extra degree of centigrade for you know wiggle room of different freezing points of jet a1 and you're back at the minus 43 so really minus 43 is your um, is, is, is your working figure um, now if the fuel temperature starts approaching these these low limits um, which is only likely on a very very long flight um, 
I've never personally seen it down much below 30, minus 30. Um, then you can either descend into warmer air uh, or accelerate to connect to increase the kinetic heating. Now acceleration is is not going to get you very far or very quickly to be honest. Uh, we know that kinetic heating is around about one degree per uh, per ten knots, and you know upper cruise altitude you don't have that many knots to play with. Um, so really, the, the 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 realistic option is to descend into warmer air. Um, I'm sure those of you that are on the uh, on the NG know that the, the and the Max. Uh, now the main tanks do have a tendency to cool down much faster than the classics due to their, their shape and size. Just one to look out for. This actually is your fuel temperature um, sensor here. Um, again, if you, 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 this photo was taken from in the wheel well, so it's, it's there, it's visible. Um, it is just a little difficult to see. Um, and it's taken a t t main tank one because that will be the coldest of the three tanks like, because there's less heat transfer from the smaller hydraulic system A. Eh? Um, the, the sense tank will be the warmest of all um, because it's not out on the wings. Um, so the so yeah fuel tank one's where it's taken from. Um, another issue that we come up against is cold soak fuel frost or wing upper surface non-environmental -envir icing. Um, I covered this already in the ice and rain protection uh, video, so if you want more details on that, then uh, please check out that video. All right, on to quantity measurement. Let's uh, let's get into the the world of how that's done. Um, the photo on the right is um, is called a a tank unit, and it's you know it's it's a probe. It's it, it's the 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 first shot at how the the fuel is measured. There are um, there are 32 of these in total on the aircraft. Uh, 12 in each main tank and eight in the center tank. And essentially, the, these are capacitors uh, where where fuel is the is the, is the dielectric. Um, I say that they're distributed all around the tanks. Um, and the reason for that is is the, to to minimise any errors due to changes in in aircraft attitude, or or accelerations. The um, the inset photo there is is from a bite test, and um, and that shows the the the, 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 com the behind the scenes conversions that is going on between between mass density and volume. Um, but essentially, these measure. Um, these measure volume, and for to get the density, obviously you need the um, the specific gravity, and that's done uh, by these compensators. So you got three of these, one in each tank, because um, you have to remember that fuel density not not only varies with temperature, it also varies with the with the the, the type, i.e., the blend of of jet fuel. You know. Not, not all jet fuels the same, um, or the same quality. Um, so th these units actually take a very, very accurate uh, capacitance me me measurement um, to to get that linear relationship between the the the, the, the fuel dielectric properties and and the fuel density. Um, and you can see in the center photo there, you know the, how it's it's acting as a capacitor. The the inset photo again from the bite test actually shows the the capacitance there of the the compensators and the tank units in the, in picofarads. So you can you can see that the you know the the level of accuracy they're taking, you know, to to a hundredth of a picofarad. So it's 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 pretty accurate stuff. Now if you want to go even more. Uh, or get even greater accuracy, um, then you've got to have densiometers um, in, installed. Um, in my experience, very few operators um, have, have got densitometers, um, and the the only way you're going to find out if you've got them fitted is <laughs> again if you if you go do a bite test and check the IDENT page. Um, and yet, as you can see on this one, they were absent. 
Um, but what what they do is is they they refine the 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 the, the SG of of the compensator, uh, and they they use a vibrating spool um, to 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 detect changes in the density uh, by by exciting it and then changing the the, the, the difference in the, the the fuel density will change the resonant frequency of that spool it's um, it, it's incredibly accurate and it improves the the accuracy of the gauges to uh, to one percent from a standard two percent on the NGs um, going back a couple of generations to the uh, the originals and the classics um, the, the, there was a capacitance trim unit and uh, <laughs> it was located in the flight deck it was it was just to the right of the captain's rudder pedals um, what a hazardous place to put that uh, you, you can see I've got two photos there, a long, a long photo and a close-up, and both of them have, have got a, a screw missing on, on these calibration units. Um, they, they really are in the firing line for, for captain's feet getting in and out of the flight deck. Um, anyway, they, they, these are used to adjust the capacitance of the, of the, of the, of the, the, the indication system, but it's only done when the tanks are dry. Um, so th th this is, you know, when the aircraft's out on heavy maintenance, um, you know, which which really only occurs <laughs> probably every seven years or so. Uh, so you get one shot every, you know, every not very often to calibrate the fuel tanks, and then leave the calibration mechanism just by the pilots. I, you know, <laughs> don't for heaven's sake if you're flying a ta um, a classic, tamper with these things. Otherwise, you'll uh, you'll never get a good fuel reading again. Um, on aircraft with uh, the, the the old mechanical round dial fuel gauges, uh, each gauge has also got a further calibration unit behind it, so that you can you can swap out the the fuel gauges, and uh, and just set the calibration uh, figure in. But uh, they're they're all a, a long way back in history. The um, the some of the originals that the, those with um with a pdcs or or an fmc and and all of the classics had a fuel summation unit which um as it boldly says up there is computerized uh the, the, this is above the the fo shoulder and these take voltage signals from the, the 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 quantity indicators and sum them to pass that figure to the fmc so that that's what that's there for it's it purely to give a a fuel figure to the fmc um, behind that panel, you've got adjustment screws for the for the calibration potentiometers for for, for each tank. So there are, there are six of those. On the NG and the Max, that fuel summation unit's gone. Um, in case you missed it, and it we've now got the a, a fuel quantity processor unit, and uh, this is in the forward electronics bay underneath the uh, the captain's control column, um, which is a um, a familiar view for those who've seen my flight controls videos. You'll you'll recognise the the other the other gubbins up there. Um, so these uh, calculate the, the 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 total fuel weight for both the gauges and the FMC. The the old thing up there on the uh, up above the windows on the classics was only to give the the fuel figure for the SM FMC. This actually g gives it for, calculates it for both the gauges and the FMC. Um, if by any chance this unit and the FMC calculated fuel don't agree for at least five minutes, then a fuel disagree message will show in the, the, the display field but by the total fuel load. So just to summarize on those last half dozen slides or whatever it's been, there are 32 tank units, three compensators and three densiometers, which I haven't photographed. They, they, they only look like a box, you know, in the, in the, in the bottom of the fuel tank. The tank units get, uh, give uh, give you volume. Uh, the compensators and densiometers give an SG. That all goes into the uh, the fuel quantity processor unit, which spits out a mass, which is displayed on the FMC, the fuel gauges, and the refueling panel out on the wing. So that's it. That's how it all it all fits together. If all of that goes south, then you've got measuring sticks. Um, the MEL does allow for uh, for a fuel gauge to be US, and um, in that case, the um, 
the engineers have to come out and actually di dip the tanks to, to to find or to confirm to verify your your, your fuel quantity. Um, it's a it's a long and painstaking job. Um, and if you ever wondered why there were two inclinometers in the wheel well, which I've shown on that bottom photo, this this is one of the reasons why, um, because the, the the engineers need to to take the readings off those to correct the the, the readings on the uh, on on the drip sticks or, or float sticks, whatever they are, to, um, to to give an accurate figure. So what happens is you is you, is you 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 untwist the the, the float stick and, and the the float stick comes down and will give you a read because the top of it floats with the with the level of the the, the fuel inside you can actually read off a figure there which needs to be corrected for for the angle of the aircraft sitting on to give you an, an actual fuel figure it's um it's it has to be done at more than one place as well, so you can't simply, you know, just just read it off one measuring stick. You you, you know, you have to read several. I say it's quite a long job, quite a long job. The indication of that fuel quantity we get um, back here in the flight deck or or out on the wing um, at the refueling panel, um, and this is what it looked like back in the beginning on the um, on the one and two hundreds. Uh, with analog fuel gauges and the the early classics, uh, certainly the early ones I flew, also had analog fuel gauges. Um, you can press and hold the quantity test button if you wish. That will uh, obviously do this on the ground, not in flight. Um, that will make the the indication smoothly drop down to uh, to zero. Um, now the the little gauge at the top there. Um, I'm sure it'd be un unfamiliar to to most on, on those with with with, um, with long memory may remember it, um, and that is a total fuel weight calculator. So, uh, so let me just show you this. I love this instrument. The, the 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 reason why this is such a good clear photo is that I, I actually have this instrument here at home in in, in my office. It's I think it's a, an absolute work of art. Um, again. If, Th this preceded FMCs by, um, but or or, or the, and the fuel total uh, reading by by about thirty years. So what you do with this is you set the use the, the the knob at the bottom right to set your zero fuel weight in in the top window. The the aircraft would would fill in the total fuel for you, which there is sixty five hundred pounds. You then, with the with the selector on the on the bottom left, select what flap you you want to land with, and the needle will will give you your V ref. So there, you, you've got flap thirty selected, and, and your V ref will be one one eight knots. <laughs> Fantastic! This is uh, as I say, who needs an FMC when you've got this kind of uh, the, uh, instrumentation? Lovely. But uh, anyway, the world moved on, and uh, the the next incarnation was uh, was were these um, sunburst fuel gauges, as, as they were called. So th these were on uh, classics with uh, with EFIS. Um, the the, the non-EFIS aircraft still had the round aisle. Um, so you've got a, a digital readout in the center, uh, you, you know, in, in, in digits. Um, but you've also got an outer display. Um, which, as you can see on the gauges, is calibrated in percent. Uh, this really should just be used as a, as a you know, ju just look at it by eye. Don't don't try and calculate the fuel off this. You, I mean, you can if you wish. I've I've never seen anyone do it other other than me out of pure curiosity. But if we go through the math, let, let let's take a look. So there are, there are twenty blocks there. I've counted them for you. So each block equates to four six over twenty, which is two th two hundred and thirty kilos. So they're, they're they're probably right. But um, but the next version of fuel gauge, with the with the Simmons, um, and you can see there's much more granularity in the in the fuel outer display. Again, it's still calibrated in percent. But you've got uh, you've got ten major blocks this time, subdivided into five. So each minor unit should be four six divided by fifty, i.e. ninety two kilos a block. But 
if you <laughs> if you do the maths, you got 92 kilos per block times by 12 on the the number one tank. That gives you 1104, not 1310. So um, I don't know why you ever would try and calculate it. I mean, I I was just curious, uh, but it the, it doesn't it doesn't quite work. Uh, just use the figure as as given, uh, the 1310 or 1320 in this case, and um, and stick with that. Um, again, there's a quantity test button. Um, now, not only does this uh, wind the, the the sunburst down to zero, but it will also show error codes. So let's have a, a quick word about those. Um, so when you press the the quantity test, you get a self test of the display. Uh, so it'll it'll show the LED, all the LEDs, then all the LEDs off, and after each test, the, the, the gauge will display an, an error code, and the error codes are different depending whether you've got a Simmons gauge or a Smith's gauge, and that's the that's the table, although the, they are the tables on the right hand side. Um, so let's let's have a little look at these in uh, in action. So after having pressed the the uh, the test button, it went through the self test, and what was left was an error code six. You go into the the appropriate table. So the, these are Smith's gauges. Uh, follow the six along, and that tells you that there's too much leakage in the tank unit. But the gauge is serviceable, and you know the gauge is serviceable because when you're not doing a test on it, it shows a fuel figure. So that that's again, we 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 don't get involved in this. We don't need to. This is just for your background information. But um, but for engineers, they they can help. Um, they they will do one of these tests if if a fuel indication issue is being reported to help them start their um, their, their troubleshooting. This um, th th this one is is an in-flight failure I had, and um, confusingly, whilst that might look like error code zero, it's not error code zero. Uh, that's just saying there's an error. And because the error is so great, I'm not going to tell you what the fuel quantity is in that tank, so I'm only going to display zero. Really, I think if, if I was designing that gauge, I would show dashes rather than a zero, um, just to let you know that it, it, it wasn't um, error code zero. The, you, you would know that was error code zero because the, the, the digit would be one place to the, the left of it. It would actually fall under the R of error. Um, and of course, you know it's not an error code because you haven't just pressed the quantity test button as well. Um, but that's that's what it will, you know, a, a fuel gauge failure looks like in flight. Moving forward to the uh, the NGs and indeed the Max because the, the the display is the same. Um, the original fuel display was was the, the 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 sort of analog round dial display that you see up there on the on the on the top photo uh, from two thousand and four. A, a totalizer display became available uh, if you also had CDS block point four installed in the aircraft, and all the gauges can be configured to display in either pounds or kilos, as as we know. The the blurry photo on the left, sorry about the quality of that. Um, that is actually showing what the totalizer display looks like if you've got auxiliary fueled um, tanks fitted. For the NG, um, error codes are not done the same way, um, and, it, and it's certainly not, you know, just an option of one to ten. Um, any errors are discovered, well, obviously reported by the crew. You know, any any faults or misbehaviour, you you then pop that in the tech log, and the and the and the NG will 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 come and do a, a bite test. Probably is is, you know, what one of the early stages in his troubleshooting and you can see an example by test there in the photo um, w which then you know t gives him something concrete to go on and and, and you know a, a process to follow um, now some faults will reduce the fuel gauge accuracy um, but the, the gauges will continue to display unless the accuracy will degrade by more than five percent in which case the fuel display will blank. So that that's how you know whether whether an, you know effectively how how serious a, 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 an error is. If 
so so the cutoff point is five percent if there are any minor errors you'll still have fuel gauge indications if there are any major errors then then it, it will just blank and it will helpfully blank and not and not show zero the various messages we we now can uh, can get on the um, on the ng and the max um there's a fuel disagree one which was uh, was showing the fmc and fuel quantity processor a disagree for more than five minutes uh, using reserve fuel, obviously we know about that. Insufficient fuel, it, and um, and low. Now, the the low on the logic changed, or or, or there's an option for the logic. Um, th th this came out of the the Boeing factory with a default of two thousand pounds or nine oh seven kilos in the in the related main tank, but. Um, for for many of us where perhaps our alternate airfield is very close to destination uh the or, or we you know we're operating uh some of the smaller variants of ng you know the six or seven hundreds uh where, where the fuel burn is less the we, we would get a low message even when we were still above normal reserves so that got fed back to boeing and they gave us an option to reduce the trigger down to a thousand pounds so it's gone from unhelpfully high to unhelpfully low, <laughs> but uh, but there we go. Um, that that that's what it is. I mean, you know, you hopefully your fuel pl planning will um, will mitigate you you getting down to those those sort of figures anyway. Um, for the max, we've got an extra one which is fuel flow. Um, the, this is shown as what. Well, now the the F comms refer to a Corrie Light message, which uh, I thought was quite quaint because I'm sure many readers of the F comm won't know what a Corrie Light is. Um, a Corrie are the manufacturers of the captions that the, the you know the physical captions that that are in the overhead panel. Um, so all all of those lights up there that the, those physical hard captions the one you you know you can you can pull out and change the bulbs in that they're manufactured by Corrie and they, these are this display is simulating those Corrie uh, light messages that that's why they've called it that um, anywho this uh, this fuel flow message w which shows that the the FMC predicted fuel flow is different to the actual indicator fuel flow for at least five minutes So um, just to sum up the, the, the various tolerances um, with the originals and uh, or classics with analog indicators. So if you've got these old old school analog indicators, plus or minus three percent is uh, is what you're guaranteed. With the um, with the sunburst displays, it's two and a half percent. And with the um, with with the NG and Max displays, it's normally two percent. Uh, or one percent if you've got densitometers fitted. Note that the the these percentages that the, this fuel tolerance is based on a full tank. So, for instance, the the NG center tank has got a maximum capacity of thirteen ton. Two percent of that without a densitometer is two hundred and sixty kilos. So the tolerance is plus or minus two sixty kilos at any fuel level within that tank. So even if you only got a ton left. The tolerance is still t plus minus 260 kilos. So um, I won't use the word misleading, but it's just something to be aware of how you know how, wh wh what this two percent actually means. Um, the the accuracy tolerance of the fuel flow transmitter is 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 a function of the fuel flow. Uh, in other words, it's, it's it's proportional to the fuel flow. So at idle, the the the, the system tolerance can be tw as much as 12 percent. During the cruise, the tolerance is actually less than half a percent or one half percent on the classics. The fuel flow indication it is integrated over time to, to to get your fuel used for each engine. So that's where the fuel used comes from. It it doesn't simply subtract you know fuel remaining from fuel that you started with. It actually integrates the fuel flow over time. So it's it's a genuine fuel used figure. All right, onto auxiliary fuel. Uh, we've touched on this a little bit earlier, but let's let's cover it in a bit more detail. Um, 
Yeah, even uh, even originals had auxiliary fuel. The uh, the VIP versions, as they were known before the the phrase BBJ was invented, um, and these uh, these systems, I, th I think only Pat's installed the um, the, the, the auxiliary fuel cells. Um, so it's the only one I've seen, and and this is it here. Uh, so you've got four cells in the forward cargo hold and four in the aft hold, and you can see those cells um, itemized in in columns on that display panel there from one to seven, with the uh, with the center tank being displayed between uh, auxiliary tanks three and four, and you can you can you know all the selections are on there and your transfer functions and and, and the like, um, with that. With the with, with the full seven tanks, uh, you you got a total fuel capacity, uh, an impressive fifty three seven hundred pounds. Um, not sure what that is in kilos. Probably about uh, twenty odd uh, ton. Um, I I don't know how far you would get um, or how much payload you could carry carrying that much fuel, but. Um, but the range was uh, was was three and a half thousand nautical miles with with full reserves, uh, which is quite impressive. The um, the auxiliary tanks are pressurised by eight psi using um, using bleed air from the the engines, and fuel transfer to to the centre tank, which is how it's used. So it's not burned directly; it's transferred to the centre tank for for use. Um, you could you could do that when the sense tank had burnt at least uh, at least five thousand pounds. So there's there's enough room in it for the for the transfer to commence. The the refueling panel for the for the auxiliary fuel tanks is separate from the the, the main panel on the um, on the two hundreds and and again that's what it looks like. Uh, you got switches and override switches there. Four tank classics. They, these were fairly common, actually. There, there, there were quite a lot of these around. Um, you know, to, to the point of almost being standard and hardly considered auxiliary fuel. But there, there we go. It's, it's labelled as auxiliary fuel. Um, now, this the, these were fitted um, in the in the, the the forward end of the aft hole, I behind the wheel well. Um, and th th this was controlled from the or the usage of this was controlled from the main panel. There were various capacities available um, from 14, uh, 1,475 litres through to 3,785 litres. Uh, so you got the extra pair of uh, fuel pumps and the extra fuel gauge. Now, these two panels show the some of the differences in uh, in auxiliary fuel. They, they, they weren't all the same because I say they weren't all installed by the same by the same companies, and they had different ways of doing it, and and, and different supplemental type certificates. Um, now your 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 FCOMs should document um, exactly, you know what what your system is. But if you've got a mixed fleet, particularly you know an an, an old mixed fleet of you know where, where you've got a number of these, <laughs> de de depending on how how well your flight ops department's keeping up, your your, your FCOM documentation might not keep up too well. So just be aware of this, and and they are different and of different usage. The the panel on the left um, is the standard one. So the auxiliary fuel transfers into the centre tank for, for for onward usage. So the lights are called no transfer, or the captions are are, are labelled no no transfer. I mean they're in opt in this photo, but you can see through them what they were. The panel on the right actually feeds the engines via the left side of the cross feed valve, so that there's you know lots of scope for imbalance there. Um, and as these pumps are you know regular pumps supplying the engines, they're labelled low pressure as opposed to transfer. So be very careful. Uh, particularly on a mixed fleet of uh, of, of aircraft um, with with your fuel panel. Um, talking about being careful, um, this photo is taken from an incident report to um, a seven three seven four hundred with the, with the registrations given there. And again, you can Google this and download the report. Um, and this one's got a slightly different panel. Um, basically, what what 
what what happened on on this flight was that the um the 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 crew used all the the wing tank fuel before the uh before the center tank fuel and the uh you know part of the human factors reasons as to why this error occurred was was this non very non standard fuel panel um but anyway you can you can read all that for yourselves in the uh, in the incident report which is available on the um on the ATSB website but the, as as regards to technical differences here the, the, this aircraft's got a, a a transfer test push button between the um the auxiliary fuel pump switches now if you if you push this it'll start a 60 second transfer uh which will cause your lights to extinguish uh if if it's working correctly and then reset uh, now what you do is you, is you push this before flight to ensure that, uh, that that the system was functioning correctly either all the fuel you loaded was going to be usable um, you know the last thing you want to do is get well I, I guess in this aircraft it could be you know across the ocean to New Zealand or something and that's not the place that you want to find out that all your auxiliary fuel is 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 not usable hence the um, hence the test button there's a there's a blanking plate underneath this because the these tanks have been removed now and, and it simply reads underneath do not remove auxiliary do not remove auxiliary fuel tanks not installed on the the bbjs uh the 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 fuel tanks the auxiliary fuel tanks are, are, are much more elaborate and configurable um However, they do take up a lot of space, as you can see in the photos there, but um, obviously I guess VIPs don't have too much luggage, or certainly not as much luggage as 150-odd um, passengers. Um, so the, the various combinations of fuel tanks are shown in that, that centre graphic there. And the, the BBJ-1, well in fact all, all three BBJs can have up to nine auxiliary fuel tanks, giving it a maximum fuel quantity of... Um, 4731 litres or 327 ton. Uh, in practice, this would probably take you over the uh, up to or you know over max takeoff weight if if there was any significant payload carried. So it's as always, it's a balance between you know payload and fuel. Um, but don't forget the BBJs do have the the, the, the strengthened wing um, of the of the 800s. So. You know that that should help with the uh, with the maximum weights. Now, the the BBJ two and three have got very slightly different maximum capacities. Um, bizarrely, the BBJ two is slightly less, and the BBJ three is slightly more. Uh, but all the same, thirty three and a half ton of fuel is is pretty impressive for a seven three seven, and that'll give you a theoretical range in excess of six thousand two hundred nautical miles. Um, the tanks are located uh, at the rear of the forward hold and the front of the aft hold to, to, to have them as centrally located as possible to reduce the CFG movement as the fuel is, uh, is, is, is both loaded and used. Um, talking of range, um, this aircraft, and I believe it's the one in the photograph, uh, November 737ER, so uh, clever registration there. Um, but this aircraft on, on proving trials, so in the very early days of the BBJ, uh, was was flown on a circuit around the, 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 the US of 6,252 nautical miles. Um, it took just shy of 14 hours. Um, and it went from Delaware, uh, w which was actually where PATs are based, so, that, so they fitted the, f the auxiliary fuel tanks then. Um, they then flew to Maine, crossed to Seattle, down to San Diego and over to, to Miami and back up to Baltimore uh, and held uh, just for the heck of it, I guess, to, to until normal reserves were, 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 were reached and then landed back in Delaware uh, just to, you know, to see what could be done. And um, as I say, total flight time, 13 hours, 51 minutes, 42 seconds. Um, it got airborne with 32 250 kilos and landed w with uh, with two and a half ton remaining. So, very 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 impressive. Um, probably not one you'd like to see on your roster, but uh, but impressive nonetheless. So um, 
we've already mentioned the the, the, the weight and balance issues with um, with with the, with the auxiliary fuel and the fact that tanks are loaded t towards the, 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 the or fitted toward the centre of the aircraft, but of course you know when you're talking nine tanks, you know the the the, the fuel is going to be a fair distance away of the from the from the CFG. Um, now what I'm showing you here on the right, the, the, this is a typical um, iPad weight and balance application, um, and um, a a friend of mine's very kindly loaded this up with with maximum fuel of of three one two four seven, to 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 show us the 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 distribution and the change in CFG. So if you go down to the graph at the bottom, you can actually see the plot of how CFG changes as the as the fuel is burned, and um, it you know it 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 certainly starts to move to toward the left hand side of the envelope there. So um, something to be aware of um that not only does does you know the the the, the fuel and the distribution of weight in the aircraft need to be in in place for for takeoff and landing but also throughout the flight as well depending on how the how the fuel burn goes the um I should say that th those of you flying you know re regular three tank aircraft i mean although you you'll see this on a on a load sheet or or a, a weight and balance application, the the movement, the change of CFG is is very much less than than it is on the uh, on the BBJs as the as the tanks are, are very close to the centre of the aircraft. The controlling all of the all of the fuel and and um, and, and the like is the auxiliary fuel control unit, and this is, sits in the forward hold. Again, taking up a little bit more storage space <laughs> that the that the tanks aren't taking up, um, and this is the interface between the, the the systems, the flight deck controls, refueling controls, and the tanks themselves. So it monitors the uh, switch and valve position, quantity, uh, tank pressure, and air ground status. Sends the output signals uh, for valve control and system alert and maintenance messages. And uh, some of the controls we've got are, uh, are shown here. Um, now, the, the, the auxiliary fuel system is, you know, it's designed to be quite pilot friendly. It's it, it's pretty much automatic. Um, it works by transferring fuel from the auxiliary tanks into the center tank, which is, you know, how almost all auxiliary fuel uh, works on the on the seven three. You can select forward or aft tanks, but the no, the normal practice is is just to put all four switches on, um, just you know switch all four switches to auto, let it do its job. That big unit in the forward hold that we we looked at will will take care of it for us. Um, the uh, the forward and aft tanks are switched off when the alert light illuminates on the main panel, just just to tell us you know that particular um, tank is empty. You know if so if the forward tanks empties then switch those pumps off. Um, there are no pumps in the auxiliary fuel system, uh, no no boost pumps. Um, cabin differential pressure is, is what's used um, unlike the, the 200 system we looked at where, where bleed air was used. Um, it, it just uses cabin diff um, and and this maintains a, a, enough of a head of pressure on the on the auxiliary tanks to, to push the auxiliary fuel into the center tank. Um, if you're flying at l low altitudes uh, or indeed on on the ground and need to transfer fuel, then bleed air can be used, and you've got the switches for it there. The the there are two auxiliary fuel sort of main panels or this display panels um, one on the captain side and one on the FO side so you can you can both monitor the fuel um, you can probably see which one's the captain's because uh, that's got the nose wheel steering on on that side as well uh, obviously nothing to do with auxiliary fuel it's just where it's located in the flight deck um, the the top display there um, shows one of the um, the maintenance messages, um, which which is simply fueling is in progress. Um, 
so maintenance messages generally for single point system faults uh, that may require maintenance action but also fueling as you can see uh, the alert messages are ones which affect the, uh, the the operation of the the auxiliary fuel and you you cycle through the messages by pushing either the alert or the maintenance button as applicable so if there's more than one message there in in memory you, you can cycle through them by pressing the button To refuel auxiliary tanks, uh, you've got an extra selector down there, which you can see that guarded switch. Um, and when you flick that guarded switch across to to aux tanks, then the displays change, and uh, you can see them there to forward auxiliary and aft auxiliary, so FA and AA, uh, so to to switch across to those two tanks. All right. Uh, lastly, uh, word on the fuel heat exchangers. Um, now, if you cast your minds back to uh, to hydraulics, you may remember that uh, there's a requirement in the FCOM of um, minimum fuel for the electric motor-driven pumps uh, for ground operation of 760 kilos in the related main tank. Now, that, that's because the, uh, the, the that goes back through the heat exchanger. Um, and we, we don't want to overheat the, the, the electric pumps. The 760 kilos of fuel, um, it's, I'll say it's arbitrary, it's not, it's not actually that arbitrary. What it, what it equates to is it, that gives a foot of fuel uh, over, the, um, over the heat exchangers. Which, which is what Boeing considers to be the necessary amount of immersion for them to, f to function as designed. So that, that's where your 760 kilos comes from. Now the warning um, about having a minimum amount of fuel um, is apparently there primarily for prolonged ground operations in hot climates and um, w w which which was news to me but th this is this little nugget of information was to be found in the um, in the fuel event to VHTJE that the the one with the uh, auxiliary fuel panel that I that I referred to uh, several slides ago so again you can you can google this and you know read about that event and and find this but the the, the I guess the takeaway point for, from this, because the, the, the crew were a little bit anxious about you know the, the low fuel state in the in the main tanks and and having the electric uh, the electric hydraulic pumps on. The, the takeaway is you can you can keep the electric pumps on with whatever fuel in flight. So if you're in a low fuel state situation, don't think you have to switch off the electric pumps, the electric hydraulic pumps. You don't. Uh, Boeing have said it's fine, keep using them. Um, and the, the rationale for that um, are that the in-flight temperatures of, of both the fuel and the hydraulic fuel are likely to be much cooler in flight than on the ground due to the cold, colder ambient temperatures and cold soaking. So, you know, d d don't worry about that. If, if, <laughs> if the worst were to happen and uh, it were to a, a pump were to get too hot, then that whichever pump it was that got hot would show overheat, and you would simply switch it off. But don't switch it off if you if you don't need to. You know, you if you're in a low low fuel state, you you've got more important things on your mind than than, than worrying about this. And the uh, the other heat exchanger uh, are that that uses fuel are the are the fuel oil heat exchangers. Uh, and there are actually two of these um, on on each engine. So there's the one for engine oil and one for IDG oil, because if you, if you remember, they're separate. And uh, and these not only cool the oil, but they also heat the fuel, um, as of course does the the, the the hydraulic heat exchanger as well. And um, Heating the fuel, you know, is 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 quite useful. Um, I mean, realistically, un, un, unless you're in a BBJ and and doing you know a, a ridiculously long flight, you know, fuel temperature shouldn't be an issue uh, for for most of us. But as I say, if if you if you are doing a very long flight on a, on a BBJ, then then this is is valuable. And again, I'm sure we all remember the um, the the BA triple seven 
um, accident going into Heathrow where um, the 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 the, the 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 fuel filter was was blocked by ice crystals after a prolonged fl flight from after a long flight from Beijing in in temperatures of I think it was about ice of minus 15 or something crazy so you know it 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 it, it could be an issue but it's 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 more you know for for the long range aircraft than, than us but uh, but you know to be borne in mind so the the, the flow anyway um, fuel from the tanks it, it it goes from the fuel pump to the IDG oil cooler and then to the, the fuel oil heat exchanger. It then comes back to the fuel pump to be filtered and uh, that, that's where your filter bypass light comes from. And then it, it's uh, from the second trip through the fuel pump it becomes actually HP high pressure fuel for the HMU. Uh, fuel for the servo section of the HMU is also uh, heated before going, you know, uh, heated again, you know, so the, 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 there's an extra heater in there before going to the HMU. And any excess fuel that bypasses it will go back to the fuel pump. So there's, there's quite a cycle there of, of, of heating and cooling, which, which is to the mutual benefit of both the fuel and the oil systems. That's it. That's, um, that's everything I know about the fuel system. Uh, as always, if you've enjoyed the video, please give it a like. Um, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so and share it amongst your friends. Um, spread the word and um, if you're feeling really motivated then uh, don't forget I've got a book out with, uh, with all this good gen in it. Alright, thanks very much for listening.